October um, edition of the Twin Cities Immigration Forum. Um, this monthly uh, meeting is co-hosted by the City of Minneapolis Office of Immigrant and Refugee F Affairs and the City of St. Paul Immigrant and Refugee Program. Uh, we initiated this meeting series to address topics of interest and concern to immigrant and refugee residents and individuals and organizations that are, serve immigrant and refugee communities. Um, this monthly series originated in 2021 as a way uh, to unpack federal immigration policies, programs, actions, and news, and has expanded beyond immigration updates to include uh, discussions on a variety of topics that impact uh, Minnesota's immigrant and refugee community. Uh, we, we, we often have uh, community and government speakers and updates on federal, state, and local issues. Um, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Michelle to introduce herself real quick. Super, thank you so much, Edmundo. My name is Michelle Rivero. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for the city of Minneapolis. And uh, I've put the agenda into the chat. I um, hope everyone is able to see it. And Edmundo, back to you. Sure. Um, very quickly, thanks. Very quickly, um, our agenda today, we're gonna, we've are gonna. we got a lot of recognitions. There's a lot of uh, events and celebrations that go on in the month of October. So we'll go through a few of those. Uh, then we'll go through city news, both from the city of St. Paul and, and city of Minneapolis. Uh, we'll then uh, have a discussion on immigration updates uh, and then additional community and government updates and close it out with uh, employment opportunities and some extra credit that we put together for everybody to read if they're so inclined. Um, with that, uh, the recognitions this month include uh, Nigerian Independence Day, um, Indigenous Peoples Day, um, let's see, sorry about that, um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, Filipino Heritage Month, German American Heritage Month, Italian American Heritage Month, um, and LGBTQ History Month. I think I've got all of them, Michelle, and we're in at the tail end of Hispanic, uh, Heritage Month, so it's a it's a very busy month and um, a lot of celebrations going on. And with that, uh, why don't we start with, uh, we'll turn it over to Tara Patet from the St. Paul City Attorney's Office to talk a little bit about uh, Domestic Awareness Month and some an event that's going on in St. Paul. Hi, Tara. Sure, uh, thanks Edmundo um, and hi everybody. I recognize some of the folks in this group um, I've been part of a quarterly meeting that we have that's really more fixed on on new visa issues. Um, but I think this is a broader group that I haven't been a part of. You know, I, there's a lot of a lot of different collaboratives that I've been part of, and I'm just not sure if I've been to this meeting before. But um, Edmundo asked me to just talk a little bit about our role um, in and just sort of in light of it being Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, I've been a, a domestic violence prosecutor for the last uh, close to 30 years now, um, and I oversee our domestic violence prosecution team at the St. Paul City Attorney's Office. We, of course, do misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor uh, prosecution. We have seven lawyers who do just domestic assault. Um, and we have a very robust um, and very busy uh, system advocate team, uh, our victim witness team of five victim witness professionals. Um, their role is to assist victims throughout the criminal justice process. Um, we, do, uh, we do outreach for historically underserved communities. And we're really, uh, I, I think our more in more recent years, we've really been intentional about trying to make sure that we're um, that we have language access, that victims, particularly victims, have uh, language access issues addressed, that we have our materials printed in in five different languages, that we are doing outreach to the community and that and kind of get the word out um, about the rights that victims have in the criminal justice process that I think a lot of people aren't really just aren't aware of. Um, to that end, if your organization does any work with uh, with a particular community that you and you think that we would benefit from learning about the work that your organization does, or you'd like us to come and talk to you about the rights that victims in uh, of crime have, particularly in the domestic world, but it doesn't have to be limited to that. 
um, the 611A, our victims' rights statute, covers um, a much you know, covers all crime victims. Um, but we'd be happy to do that. We'd love to. We'd like to collaborate with other organizations serving different communities. Um, I'm also the the U visa certifier for um, my office, and then of course, as hopefully everybody knows, Commander Lynette Cherry is the U visa certifier for uh, the St. Paul Police Department. And I get very few cert requests because I think the St. Paul Police Department does a pretty good job, or they, they have um, in recent years been really doing a nice job with uh, certifications, but um, I'm always a resource for that. I also work with the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project with Leslie Orloff um, as part of their national training team, bringing U visa and language access uh, training to professionals all over the country. Um, so it's a thing that I really like to talk to people about and am, am really interested and passionate about. Um, so as Edmundo said, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the, which is just a national campaign to rare, raise awareness um, around domestic violence and its impact on um, victims, survivors, and the community. We know, of course, that domestic violence crosses all socioeconomic, uh, racial, religious, um, uh, really all lines and affects all communities. Um, it's interesting, I was just doing a training in Portland on U visa and language access in Portland, Oregon, and uh, we were, we had some statistics that we were throwing up and and, and up up on the the uh, the wall. And there were so th about a third a third of all women in the United States will experience domestic violence or sexual assault sometime in their lifetime. Um, and with immigrant women, it's 50%. The number goes up to 50%. And this is a study that was done um, back in 2006 by battered immigrants in US, US let's see, by, well, Leslie Arloff, the director of the uh, National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project in partnership with another organization. Um, and that 65% of the people that they polled, um, of the women that they polled, um, report some kind of immigration related ish abuse. So that could be sort of emotional abuse and holding immigration status and things over someone's head, um, both in the sexual assault, domestic violence or trafficking realm. So really shocking uh, statistics and um, such a, a, a big problem um, and very complex as we as we as practitioners try to assist victims who are are going through that process. Um, October 28th, I know that the St. Paul Intervention Project is doing an event at their off in their office. And uh, Edmundo, I sent you the flyer uh, for that, and perhaps you could share that with the rest of this group. Um, we are going to, within our office, we're going to do a, an exercise for all of the, the our, our, I think, 80 employees. Um, we'll see how, hopefully we'll get good uh, participation. We're going to do a, an exercise called In Her Shoes, where someone is um, put in the shoes of a, 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 a person who's experiencing domestic violence. And this year we're focusing on immigrant women. So um, it should be an interesting thing. And I think it always raises empathy and awareness and, and I really look forward to, to doing that. Um, happy to take any questions, but that's really all I had. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me to the group. Thanks, Tara. I, you know, th those statistics you quoted uh, around immigrant women and, and the amount and the degree of, of, of violence um, they experience, um, I, I think really um, is a topic that uh, we probably should explore in, in depth in, in, a, in a future meeting, because I, I think um, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. I know our office sees, sees a, a significant amount of those cases and, um, I think it's it's worth doing more of a deeper dive and maybe even thinking about how we can address some of those issues within communities. So thank you so much. Any questions for for Tara? Anyone have any questions? Tara, I also put I put the link in the in the chat. I'm not sure if it's access accessible. 
um, but if folks uh, can open it, you can get a link to the um, St. Paul intervention. St. Paul and Ramsey County domestic abuse intervention project event on the 28th of October. Um, 6 p.m. So thank thank you, Tara. Thank Thanks you for joining us. Appreciate it. Um, awesome. Um, I want to put just a couple of things in the chat here, too. I know um, Edmundo ran through several recognitions this month uh, for a couple in the city of Minneapolis. There were resolutions for Nigerian Independence Day, which is October 1st, and then also a resolution for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So you can read them um, and then also view the presentations of the resolutions. And I've just put those in the chat as well for folks in case they're interested with regard to Indigenous Peoples Day, the sunrise ceremony in the city of Minneapolis will take place on Monday, October 14th um, at the shores of Bede Minnecaska at Thomas Beach. That's at 3740 West Bede Minnecaska Parkway. Um, the gathering starts at 7 a.m. ceremony at 715. Um, the sunrise ceremony tradition um, began in 2014 when the Minneapolis City Council officially voted to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. And the ceremony usually lasts for about 30 to 45 minutes. It is very, very beautiful, very peaceful, um, and there are warm refreshments available in case people are interested in attending. And then I also wanted to share with regard to Hispanic Heritage Month, Latino Heritage Month, um, the city of Minneapolis this week has been hosting a series of events, um, part of the inaugural Latino Business Week. And there is an event that's taking place this Sunday um, where uh, there will be an agricultural market from 4 to 7 p.m. at 200 East Lindale Avenue North in Minneapolis. And so it's a partnership that includes the Latino Economic Development Center and the Sine Foundation. I'm just going to hold this up. This is probably not the most successful thing, but um, we'll also try and share this out with folks afterwards. It's Sunday. This is a Spanish language version of the flyer, the 13th of October from 4 to 7 p.m. at 200 East Lindale Avenue. So if you're available to attend, um, this will be the last event and celebration of uh, Latino Business Week this week. And let's see. Um, as far as maybe I'll just continue with regard to city news, I know that we have several staff from the city of Minneapolis talking about um, news and developments. And so if I could turn the mic over to Christina Kendrick, my colleague with the Neighborhood and Community Relations. Um, Christina, if you are ready to talk about the senior fair that's taking place um, this month, later this month. Sure, thanks, Michelle. Um, and thanks for uh, having me come on and talk about our, uh, we're, we're calling it the South Minneapolis Senior Fair. However, this fair is for everyone across um, our beautiful city and even outside the city. Um, of course, it's for our elders. And we just solidified a partnership with Metro Transit who will provide free bus passes. Um, it's not too far of a walk, I guess, from the bus stop. Um, this senior fair is coming up. It's Wednesday, October 23rd from 9 to 2. It is at Diamond Lake Lutheran Church, which is um, in South Minneapolis. Um, the doors open at 9. We'll have uh, free refreshments, you know, kind of a light breakfast fair. Um, and then we'll have some workshops. Uh, throughout the whole day, there's a resource fair, I think, which is um, what would be very valuable for our elders. It'll have a whole host of uh, information for our older adults. Um, at noon, we will have a free lunch, uh, as well as some of our elected officials will be on a panel um, discussing and, and taking questions from the audience. And then the afternoon, we'll have more sessions. So morning is really about self-care as well as city services that folks can choose to participate in. Um, in the afternoon is public safety and community connections, which again, um, from my the explanation from the planners, um, it's a little more of a self-care, but it's kind of a fun opportunity and activity, a couple activities that will be going on. Um, we will have uh, language services located on site for folks. 
Um, the languages that we will be providing are Spanish, Hmong, and Somali. Um, and I will be putting uh, flyers into the chat um, in English and Spanish and Hmong and Somali. Um, in respect of time, I kind of went a little fast. I'm also a very fast talker. I was born and raised here, so um, I talk a lot fast. So if there's any questions for anyone um, about the event or about some of the services that we'll have for older adults, um, I want to thank Michelle and Zainab. They will be um, tabling at the resource fair as well as several other um, organizations that provide resources for a very diverse uh, group um, of elders. Um, yeah. If there's any questions, otherwise I will relinquish the mic and put the flyers into the chat. Thanks so much, Tina. And so if folks have questions, please do ask. Christina is a wealth of information and I often turn to her when I um, am speaking with a senior who has a question that I definitely cannot answer. And she always has some great suggestions and information to share. Um, so Tina, if you're cool with putting your contact information in the chat, um, I know you're a great resource and people can reach out. If people have specific questions about um, this fair that she's talking about uh, or would like to receive a copy of the flyer, we'll send a flyer out after today's meeting um, and then really invite folks to reach out um, if there are questions or suggestions regarding making events of this type more accessible to an elder community that includes folks who are born outside of the United States. I think we're all looking for um, suggestions, critiques, constructive criticism, whatever it is, um, and would love to receive feedback from you, as well as information on how to make this event um, more accessible for folks who could benefit from the, the, the rich information um, and resources that will be shared. Christ I just Christina, put it, uh, I, oh, go ahead. Window, just a quick, maybe you could just get another just reminder the time, date, and place of the of, of the fair or the event. Oh, for yep, for sure. It is October twenty third. Um, it is at Diamond Lake Lutheran Church, and it is from nine to two o'clock. And the first attempt at putting the flyer in didn't work, but this attempt actually did. It looks like so. Um, I'm also going to put my contact information into the chat. And lastly, I think I will mention this since it is uh, LGBTQ plus history month that on the 26th is the uh, National Transgender uh, Children's Day. So I just thought I'd mention that as well. Thanks so much, Tina. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Christina. Any questions for Christina? Um, if so, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, if you do not have questions, I think we're going to transition to our next topic. And thank you very much, Christina, again for joining. Edmundo, you have another question yeah. or comment? Uh, yeah, very quickly, uh, Christina, I just I just tried to open the the link for the flyer, and I got a, a message that I'm not part of the Minneapolis uh, email system, so I couldn't access it. So maybe what we can do is we can send this and the and the flyer. Um, any other flyers we have from today out in the email to, to everybody. OK, wonderful. And I'll still putz around um, to see if there's something that I can do to get the flyer into the chat um, for this session as well. But I will definitely get the flyers to Michelle. Great. Super. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds good. OK, so the next topic that we will invite um, Mina from the Arts and Cultural Affairs Department to talk on is the inaugural Cultural District Arts Fund. I know we also have a recipient, Nasreen Sajadi, from Afghan um, uh, Cultural Society too. So um, Mina, I'll turn it over to you and thank you for being with us and, and Nasreen as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving shout out to Nasreen. I noticed her as well. Um, so thank you for giving some time. Um, I am, uh, you know, presenting a link which is in the chat. Uh, it will take you to the um, Arts and Cultural Affairs um, uh, Department's website. So uh, the page will show you um, our uh, new awardees for uh, three different programs 
that are part of uh, Cultural Districts Art Fund. So this initiative is designed to empower local artists, creative entrepreneurs, and community placemaker, as well as cultural organizations such as Nasreen's, um, you know, Afghan uh, Cultural Society. Uh, there are three different programs um, that have announced the awards. Um, th one program is called Cultural Districts uh, Ambassador. So we have selected one ambassador for each of the cultural district. Um, and these cultural districts are um, situated within uh, the city boundaries of Minneapolis. These are politically designated areas um, and mainly uh, comprise of uh, local businesses and um, you know, uh, economic hubs. Uh, so for, um, for the program purposes, Arts and Cultural Affairs uh, looks at these um, cultural districts uh, beyond its business um, you know, map. Uh, so we consider consider um, everyone who lives there and practices um, the prominent cultures present in the district um, as our map of um, uh, cultural district. So you will notice, um, you know, uh, the awards are given to um, organizations who are primarily um, active in the cultural district and um, within five blocks radius from each of the cultural district. So besides the uh, cultural ambassador program, um, we also have announced um, awards for festival and cultural spaces activation. So these are um, uh, awards for um, either a substantial expression of culture and creative practices um, or uh, a series of events undertaken by um, uh, cultural producing organizations. And the third program is uh, called pop-up art activation. So um, this was mainly geared towards, um, you know, funding some wild ideas or a one-time activation uh, or one-time uh, cultural expression that is happening uh, within the districts. Um, and it was also uh, geared towards um, inviting uh, new artists or um, art advocates who want to try out something new. Um, so. Um, Again, you know, uh, there are three programs that we have um, funded. There are total uh, 64 awards, um, totaling in $690,000 across seven districts. Um, the ambassadors will be uh, convening uh, four gatherings throughout the year, um, and uh, they will be inviting stakeholders from uh, their cultural district, as well as um, anyone who is active in um, uh, community placemaking and uh, creative uh, entrepreneurship uh, in that area. Um, so I, I look forward to connect, uh, connect our ambassadors with the uh, participants of this group. Um, and uh, you will know more about uh, their activities through the news and events tab on our uh, website. So, um, and uh, I just want to, uh, I'm pr pretty excited about the dynamic portfolio of the art projects that are being funded this year. There are some new uh, festivals as well as existing festivals. Um, and um, there are 57 projects that fall under uh, pop-up and um, festivals cult and cultural spaces activation. Um, so, um, you know, what to look forward to? You can look for, um, you know, some new murals in the areas, um, native storytelling exhibitions. There will be youth art workshops um, and uh, a variety of art crawls as well as um, film screening and fashion show. The, um, the first event that's coming up is uh, Twin Cities Black Film Festival uh, at Capri Theater. Uh, that has um, a number of uh, local filmmakers as well as some of them are black and immigrant uh, filmmakers. So look for that. It's happening uh, starting today um, over the weekend. Um, what else can I, um, you know, fill in? Oh, oh uh, so the activities are open to public. Um, it's a good way for, um, you know, new uh, residents of Minneapolis, including the new immigration uh, community to get connected with each other as well as, um, you know, to their own cultures. Uh, so that will be one of the um, outreach uh, focus um, for our uh, awardees. 
and um, the new round of the uh, program will will launch earlier next year. Uh, so our budget becomes available in January. So our hope is to uh, invite everyone to apply um, sometime in uh, late February or early March. Um, if there are any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll encourage you to um, check our website and keep eye on the news and events tab. Back to you, Michelle. Hi, hi, Mina. This is Edwin Hall. Nice to see you. A uh, very quick question: uh, the cultural uh, districts. How, how are they organized? Are they organized around you know specific uh, ethnic groups, or is it a, a geographic designation? Or how, how are the how are the how are the districts designated? How did you come up with the districts? I guess. That is that is a great question. So um, the uh, history um, for for my role as a program manager that I know I'm aware of is uh, we used to have two cultural districts based on the prominent presence of the cultures um, in those two pockets. And uh, with uh, the council members activities um, and um, you know how community has responded, it grew to five cultural districts and now we have seven. So right now, uh, you know, from the from our observation, from the um, applicants' observation, um, the uh, the areas we are looking at, um, they are uh, there are mostly people of color, um, some immigration population, um, and there are actually more than one cultures being practiced. Uh, if we just have to look at the mainstream cultures, um, so uh, the main. Uh, you know, where we can say there is one prominent culture um, present are uh, Cedar Avenue South um, and East Lake Street. Um, all other cultural districts, you know, that are Lowry Avenue North, uh, 38th Street and Chicago, uh, Franklin Avenue East, West Broadway um, and Central Avenue, they all have a mixture of cultures um, being practiced and being expressed over there. Does that... Thank answer you. Yeah. the question okay yes that, thank you that, that, um, that's and also i want to add that um although there are no areas where asian culture is prominently present physically you know by home addresses um our programming um you know is eager to include um all asian cultures including Hmong, uh lao vietnamese um so uh, we will be specifically uh talking about that in our future programming that's awesome. Thank you, Mina. And um, thank you for sharing the link as well. If people have questions, please feel free to shout them out or um, or feel free to connect directly with Mina. I wanted to make sure that Nasreen, I really appreciate you coming on today as one of the grantees would love for you to share a little bit more about your organization and about your project too. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mina, for many reasons. But um, so I'm Nasreen Sajadi. I'm the director at Afghan Cultural Society. I think I'm looking through this like the attendees on this meeting and I know many of you. So it's really good to, to, to be in space with many of you again. Um, we did get this grant and we're so excited about it. Um, we are doing, I think some of you maybe remember or were in attendance to our anniversary party last year it was a big arts festival and this year we plan on doing the same um we have some pretty amazing um artists that are involved some musicians um some dancers um, and we have some ceramicists and some doll makers that are going to be present to work with youth so the plan is november 3rd um, Brian Coyle Center first, so we're going to be kind of all over the neighborhood. Um, so we're going to be first at Brian Coyle Center from around four to seven kids. There will be kids activities there and um, art workshops there for the kids to participate in and the adults if they would like. Um, we'll also have a small lunch for people there. Um, and then we will take all of the people who want to attend the other arts performance. We will walk over to the Cedar Cultural Center and we will um, listen to some really amazing music some two people who have been studying their instruments for decades will be performing for us and um there will be other community members as well present selling different goods um that they've either made or that they have access to so different 
dresses, um, jewelry, these kinds of pieces will be available to folks to purchase. This event is open to the public and it is completely free for Afghans. So if they um, need to register, they can contact us. Um, I will send um, Michelle and Edmundo the flyer. Um, we just announced, so I will send the official poster with all the details later. Um, we're really excited. I'm super excited to see all the people who receive this grant too, because so many of them are our partners in this work already. And it's great to see that we're all kind of getting to do more work together too. So thank you, Mina, for making that possible. Awesome, lovely. Thank you so much, wonderful. So we'll just turn quick, let's see. Um, sorry, while I multitask here, everybody. I, I, I just, just while you're multitasking, I just wanna congratulate Nasreen. It was, it's, this is great news and I'm very excited for you and the organization and looking forward to your event on November 3rd. So please do send us the flyer. Congratulations. Yeah, I would, I would love to see you guys there. You guys have been there since the beginning of this. So it would be lovely to have this reunion with all these people who've been on this Afghan resettlement for the last few years. That's wonderful. And I also love opportunities to actually be able to um, purchase things, you know, um, that are representative of different cultures. So I love the fact that there's that component as well. And definitely congratulations. Um, I also want to share again for Latino Business Week, the final event is on Sunday, October 13th. We'll put a link in the chat. Also wanted to share another city update and then I'll turn to Zainab, um, who has an additional update too quick. Um, there are new hires at the Minneapolis Police Department, which reflects recruitment efforts um, within the police department of the city of Minneapolis. Some of our new officers are very representative of the cultural and community diversity of our city, including Officer Ikran Muhammad, the first Somali-American woman to join the Minneapolis Police Department, and Leslie Vera, the first green card holder sworn in as an officer at the Minneapolis Police Department. So I'll just share a quick NPR um, news article in case folks are interested in learning more. I'm super excited about um, that recruitment and new hires. And I will turn it over to Zainab, who also has an update with regard to measles. Um, so Zainab, I'll turn it over to you if you're ready. Yes, hello. Um, Zainab Meyer, um, Community Relations Specialist with the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs with the City of Minneapolis. Um, just a quick update. Um, as you know, we're still in the middle of a measles outbreak in Minnesota. The recent outbreak began, began in May um, of this year, and it's basically affecting um, mostly children who are unvaccinated in the Twin Cities metro area, um, specifically in our immigrant communities. So there, if you wanted to follow the updates, um, this is the state of Minnesota. Minnesota health updates and the city of Minneapolis is also um, health department is currently working on or has just finished up um, their communications um, regarding this in um, including uh, videos um, done in Somali and English um, targeting um, or um, educating in Somali and English for the Somali com immigrant community here. Um, and I can include some of the videos as well and other the flyers that were um, translated in Somali, English, um, Spanish and Hmong. We can put that in the um, email afterwards with the notes. Now it's up. Thank you so much, Zainab. Turn it to you, Edmundo. Thank you, Zainab. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, next up, I think we should turn to, I think we can turn to uh, immigration updates. I know that Jenny Stoll Powell from the Immigrant Law Center in Minnesota is here to give us some updates on immigration news. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Edmundo. Hi, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jenny Stoll Powell from the Immigrant Law Center in Minnesota. I serve as the legal director and currently as the interim executive director. And I had a couple updates and an event as well to promote um, today. Um, the first immigration update I will share is, I believe it was just last week, that the administration um, released the refugee admissions numbers uh, for the next fiscal year. And the number again is going to be 125,000. Um, that's been the same number since 2022. Um, but I think the good news is, is 
we're seeing an increase in refugees actually being resettled. Um, this current fiscal year, um, we've resettled 100,000, which is the highest number um, in quite a few years. The numbers I saw um, indicated that that's the highest since 1994. Um, so I think that's great um, to see our resettlement network really being rebuilt and resettling a high number of refugees. Well, that was the first thing I wanted to share. Um, the second thing is about the, um, the parole program for Cubans, Haitians, Venezuelans, and Nicaraguans. It's a program that went into effect, I believe in about January of 2023, and it allowed um, Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans who had a sponsor um, to apply um, for travel authorization to travel to the United States. Um, and it allowed up to, I believe it was 30,000 um, people to come into the country um, per month um, under this program. And parole basically gave permission for people to be in the United States um, for the period of their parole and the ability to gain work authorization. And it was for a two year period. Um, and what was recently announced is that this program is not going to be renewed. Um, there will not be a process to extend the parole for anyone who came in under this parole program. Um, so once the parole expires, um, those individuals, if they don't have another immigration status, will not have a lawful status. They could um, be placed in removal proceedings and they can begin to accrue unlawful presence in the United States. Um, so someone who came in under that program, if they haven't already, should consult with an immigration attorney to see if they have another option to immigrate or to gain status in the United States. Uh, for example, through temporary protected status, um, not all of the countries are currently open for registration or have a program, um, but it, it might be an option for um, some individuals. And um, for Cubans, if, they're, if they entered with parole, they might be eligible to get their green cards under the Cuban Adjustment Act. So anybody under this program should really look and um, see if they have any other options to be able to remain in the United States since the program will not be renewed or extended once their, their parole expires. And finally, I just wanted to promote an event um, that our pro bono team has um, set up for October 19th. It's a new arrivals fair uh, that will take place at St. Stephen Lutheran Church in Bloomington. Um, it is in partnership with the Advocates for Human Rights and Volunteer Lawyers Network. Um, there will be legal consultations available, but um, People should uh, pre-register in advance um, to reserve a slot for that. And I will put um, a couple links in the, the chat, um, some resource links about the uh, parole program, and also I'll see if I can share the flyer for the new arrivals fair on October 19th. Thank that, you so much, Jenny. Any yeah, I appreciate it. If people have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, raise your hand, shout them out. Um, mixed bag of news on the immigration front. Um, really, really appreciate you sharing this update. Appreciate knowing that there is an upcoming um, um, informational event hosted by the legal service providers with St. Stephen's coming up. Um, and if there are questions that folks have uh, please feel free to ask me. Mundo, I see you with your hand raised. Go for it. Uh, Jenny, I do have one question on the um, Cuban, Haitian, and Venezuelan, Nicaraguan parole. Th does that mean people will no longer be coming in on the parole, or is it just people who are here are going to get extended? Correct. I, they are still processing those applications for new people for the two years, is what I understand. But once those two years are up, the program, you know, the parole ends. Okay. And and as far as like TPS, uh, so Haitians and Venezuelans have some T 
TPS, but they may not all qualify. It, it depends on when they entered the country, right? Okay. Um, see, there is a t- Nicaraguan TPS, but it, it hasn't reopened for new initial TPS applicants. All right, th- thank you. Oh, it looks like Nazreen has a question. I do. Um, so they're here. So let me make sure I understand this. They're here on humanitarian parolee and they're not renewing their parolee. Correct. For the people that are already here. So what does that mean for them that they're sending them back or they have to re? Is it not automatically renewing? Then no. they have to apply themselves. It's very different from some of the other programs, for example, for Ukrainians or Afghans. Um, they are not extending the parole, so there's no re-parole option. Um, so they need to look to see if they're eligible for another immigration benefit. So whether they can apply for TPS, whether they have a family member who can petition for them, or if they're Cuban, adjust under the Cuban Adjustment Act. But they have to look to see if they have another option. And if they don't, they would then be here without status, and it's possible that they will be placed in removal proceedings. Oh my God, that is devastating. Yeah, that is a reality. And so I'm super glad that this information is being shared here and people are asking questions to learn more. Catherine, I see you have your hand raised. Please go ahead if you have a comment or question you'd like to share and identify yourself for folks so that they know who you are. Yes. Um, so this is unrelated. So if there are other comments or questions about reparole or programs um, like that, I'll give it a minute before giving my update. Okay, sounds good. Um, any other questions or comments that people may want to share on this topic? Thanks, everyone. I will just say this is just a real indication of the challenges of all these temporary programs that don't lead to a permanent status. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, more to come. So we'd love to talk more about this topic at length. Um, And Catherine uh, and Jenny, appreciate you coming on again um, with Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota. Catherine, I'll turn it to you. Great. Um, Hi, all. My name is Catherine Veldheisen. I'm a program manager at the Advocates for Human Rights. Um, I also have a a double role serving as a project manager for the um, hub, which you might have heard about. Um, It's what we are calling a new initiative of the five um, immigration legal service providers to kind of um, improve and increase access to legal services in the state of Minnesota. Um, One thing that we have recently launched um, is a presentation series directed towards providers and individuals working with newly arrived non-citizens in collaboration with the Resettlement Programs Office. And so that presentation series is occurring monthly. um, And we have three different presentations that will kind of happen on a recurring basis um, directed to different kind of provider groups. Um, We had one in September um, dedicated towards educators and social workers. We have one coming up in October. I'm trying to think the date. It is on October 30th, which will be directed towards healthcare providers, so individuals working with non-citizens in healthcare settings. Um, And then our third um, presentation will be in November, on November, oh gosh, mm-hmm. we, um, I'll get back to you on the date. <laughs> it will be in mid-November, and that will be um, dedicated towards community advocates. So really anyone working with or alongside a non-citizen and trying to navigate the many different systems that they are up against. Um, so we're really excited about this. Um, all of our organizations get so many requests for presentations and information um, about working with immigrants. And so this is our way to not sacrifice getting accurate information out to the public when we have to um, you know, potentially decline requests due to lack of capacity. And so we highly recommend um, folks check that out. Um, that information will be available on the Resettlement Programs Office for the Department of Human Services. Um, 
They will also go out in certain listservs and we can make sure that that gets forwarded to um, Edmundo and Michelle as well to forward to their networks as well. So again, really excited about that. Um, it really will be a way for us to make sure we're getting good information out to everyone on a very regular basis, um, even if we aren't able to be um, kind of in all of the places at once. Um, so yes. Um, I think that was all of my updates. Um, I, awesome. Or I guess with the with the hub, I'm sure there's probably questions about what that is. I'll put my information in the chat, and I'm always happy to connect with people about what we're what we're up to. That's wonderful. Thank you. And Catherine, if there is a DHS resettlement programs office page that or you know a site that has a little bit more information about the hub that might be accessible for folks so that they could kind of read it on a website um if you could share that information that would be useful too and i see Edmundo's hands raised Edmundo, go ahead i just want to say thank you to jenny and, and catherine for the updates and appreciate it and I, I wanted to add one other update just for folks who might be following the daca litigation um seven states uh, in 2018 filed a lawsuit uh, challenging the authority of President Obama to create the DACA program, claiming that uh, the the creation of DACA was an overstep of the president's authority, but also challenged it based on uh, additional costs that were incurred by states because of DACA. Um, that case has been bouncing around through the courts of, uh, for for a number of years, and oral arguments on on the, at the Fifth Sec U.S. Uh, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals were heard this week. In fact, I think they may have even been heard today. So I just wanted to let everybody know that that case is still pending. Uh, the case uh, was argued this week and uh, more updates to come for sure. Thank you for that update. And um, if folks have questions in the, if you wanna put them in the chat, if you wanna share them out loud, please feel free to do so. Also wanna share with regard to the topic of accessing Immigration legal service providers. I know that that is a question that arises all the time. Um, and just know that at Career Force um, at 777 East Lake Street, um, we host weekly community hours from 2 to 4 p.m. on Wednesdays and um, often have immigration legal service uh, providers available to connect with community members um, on Wednesdays from 2 to 4. Don't hesitate to reach out to Zainab Meyer who is here or myself, and we'll put our contact information in the chat if you'd like to learn more. Again, at Career Force on Wednesdays from 2 to 4, immigration-related information and other resource um, information as well. So thank you very much. And then our next topic, um, let me see. What is our next topic? I, I think we're up to uh, additional community and government updates. Uh, so we're turning over, over uh, to everyone on the on the in the meeting if anyone has updates they'd like to share um we'd like to give you all an opportunity to do that now i see william with his hand raised go ahead uh, William. thank you thank you michelle and mundo yes i would like to announce that the resettlement programs office use open two positions the one is the immigration policy supervisor is for a lawyer and this post will end on October 24. And the second position is for the resettlement service supervisor. This post ends on the 28th. So I post the your positions in the chat. So if somebody is interested, please share with your network or apply to this position. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, William. Appreciate it. And I'm um, looking to see, the, did you already post the links or are you posting them now? Because I'm not Yes, I post the links that are just before the, the flyer, the year after the flyer from Minneapolis Latino Business Week. Great. It's a 5 or 5 p.m. is the time. Tap. I see them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. So we'll copy those two and we'll send those out afterwards. Um, other updates that people may have to share that you'd like to share with the group. News, events coming up. 
I don't see any hands raised. We could go to extra credit, Edmundo, if you want to do that. Uh, we have a, a few articles this, this month in, in extra credit. Um, we'll, we'll, I will post if people are interested. First is a article in the uh, Minnesota Star Tribune. I keep forgetting the paper has been rebranded. Um, entitled, My Father Fled Haiti, Now I'm Helping Build America. We'll put a link to that article if people are interested in, in seeing it. Um, also, one Latino Heritage Month activity sponsored by the Somos uh, ERG in, in Minneapolis was a documentary screening on children as interpreters for their families. And we'll put a link to that uh, for more details uh, on that and how to watch that movie. Um, also, there's uh, volunteer opportunities for food distribution at Cochrane Park in Minneapolis on Fridays through Sunnet Foundation. And we'll put some contact names and, and emails for uh, folks with uh, Sunnet Foundation if people are interested in volunteering uh, at the food distribution on Fridays in Co Cochrane Park. And then finally, there, we're going to uh, post a Star Tribune article uh, that discusses uh, a guide that is a guide to understanding immigration terms. Um, so if people are interested in, in Understand having a better understanding of immigration terms. Uh, this is a useful article that you might find of value. Um, with that, turn it back to Michelle. Yep, there's one more thing I wanted to add for folks. Um, I know that in Minnesota, there is, or in Minneapolis, there is a film festival, the Cine Latino. I don't know how many years this has been going, um, but it looks Awesome. So I think it runs through the um, 13th to the main cinema, five days of Spanish and Portuguese films. So also putting a link to Cine Latino in the chat in case folks are interested in attending um, any of the films that are running through October 13th. And um with that, maybe we can wrap. I don't know. Is there anything else? I don't see any other um, extra credit items. Um, and we talked through how to stay in touch. This is a monthly forum. If you have updates that you'd like to share, if you'd like to bring a topic to this space, please do reach out to Edmundo, Zainab, um, or myself, and we would love to invite you to speak or um, talk through the topic you'd like to bring to this space. Our meetings are the second Thursday of the month. They are recorded and are available afterwards on the office, the City of Minneapolis Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs webpage. Um, and we'll turn it back to Edmundo to close it out, unless there's anything else that people want to share today. Give people a minute if anyone wants to share anything else. Otherwise, we'll see you uh, next time, be November 14th. Given that uh, Friday is November 1st, it's going to be a little bit later in the month. So we'll see you all on the 14th of November and uh, appreciate you all being here. And uh, I see my text in is slipping in um, and uh, have a have a safe uh, end of October and a, and a happy Halloween, everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Take good care, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Nice. Thank you.